smoke a 90 horsepower Miata unless you're talking about we just got a thumbs up. <laughs> there you go. So if you want an enthusiast car that'll get you a thumbs up, buy an R129 Mercedes. Hey guys, how's it going? My name is Jeff and today I'm going to tell you about the how I bought the cheapest R129 Mercedes-Benz. So sitting behind me here is a 1999 Mercedes-Benz SL500. Now the best part about this is that Hoovy's Garage actually bought one of these a little while ago, claiming that it was the cheapest at the time, and it may have been. When he bought his, it was the older pre-facelift. This is the 99, so this is the last facelift car with all the good bits, engine swaps, transmissions, all that. But he bought his for about $3,000, I believe, when the, the gentleman was asking $3,500 for it, and it was a flood damage car. This is not a flood damage car, and I managed to pick it up for just $2,800. So, that being said, it's far from perfect, but we'll go ahead and we'll go through some of the details and talk about some of the things that I've already fixed on the car, and we'll go ahead and take it from there as I give you sort of a walk around some of the history of the car behind me here. So getting started just by looking at it from here, you can already tell it's been modified a little bit because the wheels that are sitting on it are actually the later generations wheels. So these actually belong to the R230 generation of SL. Uh, because they're the AMG wheels, I believe they're from technically an SL55, but that's one of the, I guess, weird differences. So being that this is the 99, so 99 to 2001 was the facelifted model. The R129 was produced from 1989 up until 2001, with 99 and 2001 being that last facelift. That also featured an engine change and a transmission change. So a lot of the early cars were some other styling cues that changed like this. This went from three to two vents. Um, and you'll notice that this is the sport package here. So what that means is this has the twisty little curly do at the weird. Um, it does have a different front bumper and rear bumper. Now the front bumper on this car is unfortunately damaged, which I think does contribute a little bit to the price there. But you can see from the fog lights and stuff that are in here that this is actually a sport package that's on the car as well. Um, I have swapped out the grill because this, the one that I had was a little bit damaged, but I still have it with the car. And then this, of course, features the stupid uh, headlight uh, wipers there which I'm personally not a huge fan of, but they're on it anyways. So there's that. It does have a cool, awesome silver to it. I love the name of the color. The color is called Brilliant Silver. And of course, being a US spec car, this has the clear turn signal indicators for the most part. Um, so that's a sort of US spec thing there as well. The early cars also have like a four speed slush box, automatic. Unfortunately, all of the R129s were automatic only, just like the R107, which is the previous generation. But this has the 5G Tronic 5-speed, which actually lets you manually shift kind of through four gears, which is pretty cool. And it's kind of like a variant of the SLR McLaren as well, which is just a little bit of a touch. It's kind of interesting, I guess. And as we sort of move to the back again, these have some really massive wheels, by the way. These are like 275s that they typically fit in the rear of the car which are insanely wide. And then if we come to the back, another thing that's sort of changed is obviously these are considered SL 500s, as opposed to some of the R107 cars when they're kind of considered 560 SLs. So it's a little bit different. And then the later cars also had slightly different tail lights with the way that they wrap around the exterior here, um, being sort of mostly red as, a, as opposed to red and orange. And now here is our little trunk space where we have some of the extra parts that we've bought. What's cool about these is these are actually hardtop convertibles and back in here is actually where you'll find the little wind vent that you can kind of see in there if you look closely. And that's essentially the windscreen that helps when you have the top down to keep down some of the wind noise. We have our Mercedes jack and the Mercedes toolkit in here as well. We're missing some of the regular panels and stuff like that, but it's not really a big deal. Mostly everything's intact. And what's weird about this car is the main features being that this is a convertible. So this is a hard top. This is a removable hard top. You have to go ahead and pop it. And the car uses what's called electro hydraulics in terms to operate all of the uh, convertible bits and all that stuff that's inside the car, including the locks. Whenever you lock the car, you can hear all these really solid thuds and everything. Let me see if we can give you an example here. So if you listen, all of those locks and everything that you're hearing, and I'll unlock it. All of that is done through all the actuating. It's a very solid thud that's sort of very reassuring in terms of how the car unlocks everything. As for the top, you manually remove this hard top and then there's actually a soft top that is moved through the way of hydraulics. Now that may sound cool, but that's actually one of the worst features about this car because with age, a lot of them have to be replaced and changed out. 
And so what happens is, is it's not that cheap to either try and find new versions. So most of them have to be rebuilt, which still ends up costing you at least $2,500 just to find somebody who's even willing to rebuild some of that. And through some of the stuff that's happened with this car, you can even have it where it sprays hydraulic fluid all over you um, if it's not happy and some of the seals end up breaking on the car. So let's go ahead. Oh, the car just locked on me for not unlocking it. Let's go ahead and take a look at the engine bay. So. The SL500, for the sake of explaining some Mercedes terminology, Mercedes has always used, well, up until recently, the letters always told you what the engine size was. So being that this is a 500, it means it's got a five liter V8, which is the same. It used to have an M119 V8. This has the M113 V8, which is still a five liter with about 302 horsepower, um, which is super awesome, like 340 foot pounds of torque, something like that. And one of the things I want to show you is how weird these are to open the hood. It took me about five minutes to figure it out. So. Once you pop the hood, normally you reach under and there's a latch. So you'd think you'd reach under here, but that's not true. You reach into the Mercedes emblem and there's this little plastic lever that you pull right here and then the hood pops up. So this is our engine bay in here. So what's really uh, kind of annoying about this, having recently gone through it, is so obviously this is our five liter V8, but the air is actually kept under each side. So there's an air filter here and an air filter here. So anytime you replace the whole air filter system, you have to go through, take off this entire big piece here, and then you're able to fix it. Now, one of the things that was broken is my car originally came with a check engine light, but what actually came to fix that is underneath this plastic piece here, pop that off, is this thing. And this is what I just replaced. This is the secondary air injection system. And essentially what that is, is when you first start the car and the catalytic converters are cold, the engine's cold, this helps pump air through the car to sort of make sure it runs cleanly, so to speak. So that'll cause a check engine light, but I've since been able to register the car and have it pass smog here in Arizona. So that's super awesome there in terms of getting the car to pass. Now, you can find all sorts of other stuff here. It's amazing how much stuff they managed to fit in here without actually fitting everything. So obviously the fuse boxes are in this back corner. Um, we have some of the brake stuff, some of the other suspension bits and all that. Uh, fluids are all on the left side there. Um, and then some other bits, but they still have to put the battery in the back along with all of the hydraulic stuff for the interior is all in the back as well. But like I said, this is a pretty nice V8. The car is super smooth to accelerate and it just looks kind of good. Obviously, it's pretty cool to have a 5 liter V8, basically a Mustang without anybody knowing it. Most of the people I've talked to don't even know how fast these cars are or what engine they have in them. Let's go ahead and take a look at the interior of the car. So, also I just want to point out these pillarless doors here look really good because this part is actually part of the hard top. So when you take this off, the car's got a really nice silhouette um, that looks fantastic. But if you go ahead and take a look at the door cards here at first, you can see we've got all of our seat adjustments and everything in here. And this does come with a Bose sound system from the factory. You've got side airbags and everything. And you can fully adjust the seats using this, which is pretty sweet. you got your headlight stuff here. And of course, you got our seat and everything. Um, what's different is these cars have a slightly different stylized uh, chrome badging around all the gauges. We have that five speed, like I said, where you can sort of manually shift through some of the gears, some sport and wet modes, adjustable mirrors. This little cool button right here is actually how you adjust the top. So you can pull this back or push it forward and that will actually raise or lower a lot of the hydraulics. You have your window stuff here and then of course all of your regular AC system vents and then up here, this cool little hidey hole, if I can get this to open up. Cool little hidey hole for stuff, since there's not a real glove box in this car, you can put stuff in there. Or on each side of the door, there's also these little pop-up things that also serve where I managed to find a bunch of miscellaneous CDs and things. Now ignore the mess, but we go ahead and pull the seat back. You can see there's no back seat, but there is a lot of space. This is also where you'll find your Bose subwoofer, and you'll even see this roll bar. So this part here is the roll bar that pops up in the case of a crash, and it pops up as fast as an airbag, believe it or not. It gets activated, will pop up, or you can electronically raise it and lower it through a button. Another thing I should point out that's a little bit uh, specific to this car is this is the first car to have seat belts in the seat. So these seats, like I said, you push this forward, and seat belt on your way like you find on some other cars. So this is one of the first cars to actually have the seatbelt integrated into the seat. We have an adjustable armrest. So that pulls out like that so you can have it a little bit adjustable. Your cup holders and things pop out and they're hidden in there. 
And then, if we go ahead and open this up. I, this car, came optioned with a Motorola Mercedes cell phone. Look at this, it's even got the Mercedes badge on it. How cool is that? Nothing better than just being able to talk on your Mercedes cell phone. Super cool piece of kit, considering this is a 99 car. So very special. And that's basically taking a quick look at the exterior of the car there. It's a pretty interesting car, all things considered. Knowing it's from 1999, it's got a lot of different aspects, I guess, that you'd be surprised to have on this car. But you have to remember that these were $80,000 to like $120,000, depending on the model and everything that you had for the car. And it just has a lot of modern day features that you won't typically find in sort of uh, certain variants of cars and things like that. Now, I do want to give you a rundown of sort of what the car sounds like and some of the other bits that we can do with it um, and sort of talk about what it's like to drive this car. But more importantly, one of the design features that often goes unnoticed, I think, is these fenders here. So if you sort of come back here and look at the side profile of the car, you can see just how much those fenders actually stick out and it looks absolutely gorgeous. And then moving to the front fender, lots of subtle styling cues actually done by Bruno Sacco that look absolutely incredible and these cars were supposed to come out a lot earlier but there were some other issues and delays that would uh, result in them coming out way later giving the R107 the previous generation a very long life cycle but this car is super cool has a ton of different uh, features in it and I think they're pretty good looking cars obviously you need to fix the front bumper especially with the AMG styling and then if you want to throw monoblocks on them they also look really good that way so without any further ado let's go ahead and let's talk about what it's like to drive Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what this car is like to drive. So first of all, like I said, you can actually sort of manually shift it almost like a semi-automatic through first through fourth, or you can just throw it in drive, which I generally prefer because I think it just shifts a little bit better and makes everything a little bit easy. When you're sitting in the car, it's got a really cool low seat to it that feels pretty good. And then as far as uh, sort of seating position, obviously you saw all the adjustable knobs that are available over here. You can actually electronically adjust the steering wheel as well, making it pretty much you can customize the seat exactly as you want. You can raise it, lower it, move the steering wheel in and out. And then when you need it, it's got a pretty good get up and go as well. But I think the best part about it is even with the V8, it's fast, but it's got a pretty smooth acceleration to it, which is really nice because it's at the end of the day, you know, it's an $80,000 to $120,000 Mercedes when new. So you'd want something that accelerates pretty smoothly. But this one actually has a tuning chip, which I kind of want to take it to a dyno and see if I can get a before and after to see if those tuning chips really do anything, especially for a car like this. But it's a really pretty car and I think you really enjoy the driving experience. And then with the top down, it's also just a totally different car uh, from what you'll experience. Now admittedly, for as far as the handling aspects of the car go, it's not that interesting to drive as a sports car. This is a very heavy car after all. This car weighs uh, probably, I believe in the neighborhood of about 4,500 pounds. And so it's very heavy. Uh, it doesn't offer anything that crazy. Um, as far as performance wise, the steering is fine, but it's not overly direct. It's not light. It's a very heavy, floaty filly car. I would say it's more of a Grand Tour, despite the SL actually stands for sports light which basically means lightweight sports car, which is true of its origins of the 300 SL, the Gullwing, but not so true of any SL really that's come after that. They've always sort of been really heavy cars, and this is no exception. So um, despite having bigger horsepower options, and there was a bigger brother to this car, so the next step up would have been the uh, uh, 600, the SL 600, which actually has a 6 liter V12, uh, which is super large um, as far as engines, but of course that you know, introduces um, some different problems and stuff like that. If you want a V12, obviously that's great and all. Um, but I think the V8's great because you're just kind of keeping things a little bit simpler. Um, assuming, yeah, you want to buy something of this caliber. But if you do want to buy a car like this, uh, you'll definitely want to check and make sure there's no problems with the convertible top and some of the things of that nature because that's the stuff that's really going to rack up some of the cost. There's some other things like the SL600s all came with the adjustable suspension that was all done hydraulically as well, um, which is one of those things when you see some of the older Mercedes that like look like they're slammed or lowered basically riding on the back shocks. That's usually when some of that air suspension stuff fails and then the car's sitting on the back of the suspension. So there's some things like that to consider um, that come as part of the problems with buying certain luxury cars um, because they're just 
you know, they're, they're, they're things that are nice luxuries to have, but if you're not spending a ton of money maintaining them, they'll cost you a ton of money later to go and fix everything up. So that part can really, really suck. But if you want something like this, these cars are a ton of fun to drive. They're two-door sports cars, essentially, even though they're not the sportiest, but they're still fast. They'll definitely smoke most of the basic cars out there in terms of other things. Like, obviously, it'll smoke a 90-horsepower Miata, unless you're talking about we just got a thumbs up. <laughs> There you go. So if you want an enthusiast car that'll get you thumbs up, buy an R129 Mercedes. Like I said, this one's a facelifted. These generally do sell for a lot more. Uh, mint condition version of the later facelifted cars will run you twenty to twenty-five thousand, as opposed to the earlier cars, which you can generally pick up um, in, in mint condition for like ten to fifteen. So it kind of depends. Again, they're different engines, different transmissions. I know the four-speed automatic in the earlier cars kind of feels like a slush box. So generally, people recommend these later ninety-nine to two thousand and one cars. So with that, that's going to be the end of the video, guys. Thank you so much for watching. If you could throw me a like, I'd really appreciate it. And get subscribed so you don't miss out on more videos like this in the future. I can assure you there will be more cars coming through to make videos like this with. So definitely get subscribed. Let me know what you think below. If you would buy an R129 Mercedes and whether you'd prefer an early car or a later car or if you just kind of stay away from these things in general. I know some people don't always like their Mercedes Roadsters, but I think this one is awesome as long as you buy the right example of that. So with that, thank you so much for watching, guys.